a little bit of a technical issue there that you didn't have slides on your uh, uh, screen, but I hope you enjoyed the song. Appreciate uh, Miss Brenda recording that, or Miss Deborah recording that ahead of time. And uh, But it's good to be here tonight. This is uh, hopefully our last um, time to do this uh, with nobody in the auditorium. I do have a few people uh, uh, here this evening, just a couple people, but uh, uh, I'm looking forward to next Sunday night getting back to normal. That's one of my favorite times together is Sunday evenings uh, with the church family. And so I'm really looking forward to getting back next week. And so hope that you'll be here uh, next Sunday night. Had good services today. I uh, had a baptism in the first service and then a, a new family join in the second service. And so we're certainly glad God is still stirring the hearts of people, uh, even in the midst of all that's going on. And we're looking forward to seeing what God has the rest of the year here at Victory Baptist Church. Before we jump into the message tonight, just one uh, thing I want to clarify and remind you of is we are currently taking up a special love offering for our teenagers before they go to camp this summer. Uh, we mentioned that uh, over the last couple of weeks, and that, that would be coming up. That started today, and um, a couple of people have asked just uh, what we're targeting, what our goals, and um, so you guys have always just given really generously uh, towards that group, but uh, thought it would be good to kind of tell you what we're shooting for. Uh, we have about 40 kids uh, right now and counselors ready to go to camp, and so with the cost of camp, that's around about $10,000, something like that, and uh, so if uh, that's kind of a target that would help you guys know what we're shooting for, uh, that would pay for the uh, majority of everything to as far as the uh, uh, the fee to go, and then on top of that, we have about $5,000 in travel expenses uh, for the bus that we charter and the fuel and all that goes with that. And so those two dollar amounts are what we're looking at. And so if you would be led to give towards those, uh, we would appreciate that. You can do that on our app. You can send in a check by mail or through your bank, or you can uh, give um, uh, next Sunday, or certainly you could drop it off by the church. Um, but I know that's a worthy investment for our young people, so I hope that you'll get involved with that. That, of course, is in lieu of our bake sale this year, and uh, we hope to be able to do that again next year. It's always a great time to get together as a church family and celebrate uh, for our kids. It's really just a fun time to get together as a church family. All right, well, uh, tonight, grab your Bibles. We're going to be in Joshua uh, chapter 9, continuing our study there. And uh, while you're making your way there, uh, I read a quote this week, and I forgot to write the author down, but... Uh, uh, someone once said, whoever longs for a quiet life has been born in the wrong generation. And uh, I know that that quote was a long time ago. Uh, again, I think it was in the 1800s. I'm, I'm trying to remember who wrote it. But the uh, point is this, his statement was meant to be um, a little bit ambiguous because the truth is every generation uh, is filled with turmoil. That is the reality of it. And sometimes we get feeling like in our scope and where we live and the time that we live that uh, um, it seems like we're the only people that have ever faced trials and tribulations. But when you read the Bible and you study history even just a little bit, uh, you'll quickly realize that no generation has ever really been free uh, from conflict. And it's a reminder on a spiritual level for you and I that Satan, Satan is always, he has always been working behind the scenes. He's always been active since, since really even before the garden. He started this back uh, uh, before uh, even the garden, whenever he was in, in heaven, started an uprising, working against the, the will of God, and certainly has always done that. He's done that all through history. And so we know that um, uh, he is active. We know that he's trying to get us to stumble, to sin, to fall away from the Lord. And I don't want to take away from his influence, but if, if we were honest, I think sometimes we give Satan too much credit, uh, because the reality is this, that that if you and I were honest about our own lives and the ways that we sin, uh, sometimes we could be our own worst enemy. Uh, sometimes uh, we are at fault more than Satan ever is, because the truth is Satan is just an opportunist. He capitalizes on our weaknesses. In fact, James chapter 1 talks about that, that we, we sin when we're drawn away of our own lust and enticed. And so we give Satan all the material that he needs too often uh, and give him way too much credit when often it's our own doing. We're going to see that tonight in Joshua chapter 9. Before we jump into chapter 9, just a recap from last week. Uh, the Israelites had returned to Ai where they had suffered a defeat. And they successfully uh, pull off this ambush with the armies of Ai, destroy the city, laid waste to it just as God had decreed, had commanded them to do. And, and uh, so that's where we ended last week. We didn't cover all of chapter 8. They go on to build an altar and worship the Lord and... And uh, we didn't cover that, but uh, as we get into chapter 9, I'll be honest, from, 
uh, my personal study, this, is a, this has always been a little bit of a perplexing story to me. Uh, when, as we get on into the, the substance of the, the chapter, you'll see what I mean if you haven't studied this before. There's some strange things that take place that honestly when we get there, I don't know that I have a complete uh, understanding or certainly don't even really know how to completely convey what takes place in a way that at least even satisfies my, my thoughts. And I'll explain that as we get there. But we see a story here of God of God's people failing uh, to seek him before they make a big decision. And yet at the end of it, we see God extending uh, incredible grace as God always does. And I want to read um, the first 15 verses. Uh, we're going to cover the majority of the chapter, but if you'll look with me in your Bibles, we'll read together um, and at least get the initial part of this, um, this event um, on paper here as we'll read it, and then we'll jump off into it. So look there in verse 1. Uh, came to pass, it says, when all the kings which were on this side Jordan in the hills and in the valleys and all the coasts of the great sea over Le- against Lebanon, the Hittite and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite heard thereof, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wilily and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles old and rent and bound up and old shoes and clouded upon their feet and old garments upon them and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua unto the camp at Gilgal and they said unto him and to the men of Israel, we be come from a far country. Now therefore make ye a league with us. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, peradventure ye dwell among us and how shall we make a league with you? They said unto Joshua we, Joshua, we are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Well, who are ye, and from whence come ye? And they said unto him, From a very far country thy servants are come, because of the name of the Lord thy God, for we have heard the fame of him, and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites, um, and uh, that were beyond Jordan, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, uh, which was at Ashtaroth. Wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals, Uh, with you for the journey and go to meet them and say unto them we are your servants therefore now make ye a league with us verse 12 says this our bread we took hot from our for our provision out of our houses on the day that we came forth to go unto you but now behold it is dry and it is moldy and these bottles of wine which were filled were new and behold they be rent and these are garments and our shoes are become uh, old by reason of the very long journey and the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the lord And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. So what we see just in a a brief reading, and there's a lot taking place there, uh, but just a cursory reading, what we we can gather, at least two quick things here, is that one, even even a great leader like Joshua, who we know is seeking the Lord, we know his heart is to follow the Lord, and yet it's possible even for somebody like Joshua to have a lapse in discernment, and that's exactly what takes place here. Something else we see and we're reminded of is Satan never runs out of methods to deceive us. Again, using ourselves against us. And so as we see this story unfold, we'll just kind of quickly tonight, a little bit, uh, probably a little bit more brief as we run through the outline, just to kind of hone in on some points of the story, and then really want to spend most of our evening in the application tonight. What we first see is this is a crafty enemy. Uh, that's, uh, that has come to Joshua. Everything is taking place. Um, everybody's making this alliance, first of all. Joshua and his armies have destroyed Jericho. They've destroyed Ai. And so the, the kings, the cities that are all throughout the land of Canaan, um, they're beginning to catch wind of this. And, you know, obviously it's becoming clear that one city cannot on its own stand up against Joshua and Joshua's army. And so a group of six kings form what I'll just call an unholy alliance. They prepare for battle as a coalition of kings. That's, that's what is spoken of there, which is, by the way, in, in a human mindset, uh, forming this alliance is a smart thing. Uh, they know they have no chance individually to, to take on Joshua. And the Bible says that they are in one accord. They come together. Uh, again, often those tribes and those cities, when they would have come together, uh, it would have been a hard thing to come together in one accord, but they have a common purpose now. And every tribe has its own agenda. And this agenda really boils down to this. They want to survive. They just simply want to survive uh, Joshua and his army. So this unholy alliance comes together on one side of, uh, of the valley or in, in one part of Canaan. And on the other side, we have the Gibeonites who have this unorthodox plan. 
Now, the Gibeonites, when they hear what God has done, uh, rather than try to form an alliance to go to battle, uh, they come up with a different conclusion. Their conclusion boils down to this. They decide it probably doesn't make much sense to try to do battle uh, against Joshua's army. Uh, let's instead make a plan to make peace. And I don't blame them for that. Honestly, when you look at what's taken place from a human standpoint, if you can survive as a people, that seems to make a lot more sense than, than walking into utter annihilation. And so they come up with this plan of deception. Um, and I've thought about this, and this is where it begins to get a little perplexing for me. Um, why not just come right out and ask Joshua? Just send a couple of delegates and say, listen, we know who your God is. We know uh, that we don't stand a chance, and so we're asking for, for a peaceful surrender. Well, the answer is this. Israel would not have been allowed to give them that kind of peaceful surrender. You see, God had given Israel a plan back in Deuteronomy for attacking uh, the cities. You know, and he said he gave them this, basically this battle plan wherever they were at, whether they were uh, near where they were or whether they were far. Any, he gave them this instruction in verses 10 and 11. He said, when thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And it shall be, if it make the answer of peace, and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. So there was an allotment for peace, uh, if, if uh, uh, the right conditions were there. But there was an exception down in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 15. He says this, Thus shalt thou do unto all the cities which are very far off from thee, which are not of the cities of these nations, but of the cities of these people which the Lord thy God give thee for an inheritance, Thou shalt save them, uh, save alive nothing that breatheth. And the point is this, that, uh, he, that, that phrase in verse 16 where he says that the, the God doth give thee an inheritance, that, that city or that group of cities, uh, they would be given no peace. They were to be utterly destroyed. So no city that promised inheritance was to be given peace. Now, I don't know if somewhere along the line the Gibeonites understood this. Um, it's possible. But the point is this, that that even if they had come to Joshua, being of that land in that particular area, Joshua would not have been able to give them peace because of God's commandments. And so they come up with this ruse. We read it. They come up with this plan, and they go into great detail, and they, they take bread that's been left over for several days and make sure it's moldy, and, and they take and put on their feet old sandals and dried up wineskins, and they really make this look as though they've been off in the wilderness for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And they come to seek peace with Joshua. Well, then we see a hasty decision by Joshua in verses 14 and 15. We read that there at the end. Um, Joshua seems, by the way, to sense that something's not really right here. Uh, you see the questioning. We read it. You see them questioning them two, three, four times about some very specific details. And so it seems as though the Lord is trying to prompt him, hey, there's some red flags here. And so they, uh, they begin to examine everything. The problem is they're seeking their own wisdom. They're using their own intelligence and discernment as they inspect everything. In fact, it's very specific the way that it's worded here, that they, they inspect the moldy bread. Uh, they, they handle it, and they look at the worn-out sho shoes, and they look at all the circumstances. And then collectively, as a leadership group in, in, in Israel, their conclusion is simple. Well, it appears they've come from a long way. So apparently, they've come from a long way. Rather than looking at the red flags, rather than seeking the Lord, they use their own wisdom. And that's the problem. They failed to seek the Lord. And they end up making peace with the enemies of God. Now that's, man, we could park there, and I started to spend a lot of time on that thought, but that it's possible for us as God's children to, to make an allegiance or an, uh, make allies out of the enemies of God. And I would just simply say, be careful who your allegiances are with. The Lord just really directed me to keep moving, but just let that hone in and, and sink into your thoughts. Be careful who you make allegiances with. And so they make peace with the enemies of God, and even though God had commanded that they be wiped out, that all the inhabitants of Canaan be wiped out, because remember, these are things that are hard to understand in the midst of this study. Remember, it had been established that these nations, these cities, um, they were under the judgment of God because they didn't turn to God when they had the opportunity. Well, now here's the scary part. If you're listening tonight and you happen to be one of our leaders, or maybe you're in a different church and you're in a, leader, a leadership position in a different church, here's the, here's the frightening thing that really sticks to me. Look at verse 15 again, because this wasn't just Joshua that made the decision. It says, Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live, 
And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. And so in other words, the leadership team is how we might word that today. Uh, in unison, together, came to the same conclusion that they should make an alliance with this group of Gibeonites. And I'm sure, having led several uh, leadership meetings through the years and been a part of leadership teams, I'm sure that as this group of, of men, uh, I can kind of see them in the, in the wilderness there as they're all gathered maybe with these Gibeonites and they're looking, they're inspecting, they're discussing, and they probably even pardon themselves a little bit. Let's go over here to, to our tents and let's talk about this. Let's have a little roundtable discussion and they began to think about, hey, this is a good opportunity for us to maybe extend some benevolence to some people. We are, uh, after all, uh, we've just wiped out several cities. We're getting ready to wipe out several more. Maybe, maybe this would look like a peaceful gesture that we are indeed people of peace. We're not necessarily warriors. And in some regards, uh, you look at it from a human standpoint, they did their due diligence. They asked questions. They asked even what seems to be the right questions. They inspected the evidence and they discussed it amongst themselves and they came to the same conclusion. Now here's what I would say to that. It is so important for a, a leadership team, whether it's in a church setting or business setting, uh, it doesn't matter. It's important that a leadership team be in unity, absolutely, to be in unity with one another. But it must also be in unity with God. And I would just tell you, man, that's kind of scary to me uh, and I, I just uh, hope our leaders are listening it's a good reminder for all of us that it's good for us to be on the same page, but we better all be on the same page with the Lord. Well, here's what inevitably transpires. Three days later, they discover who these delegates really are. Three days. Uh, if they'd only delayed three days. I don't know how all this happens. Somehow they, they catch wind. Uh, maybe somebody's come into their camp. I don't know exactly. The Bible doesn't specify that. But within three days... Uh, they are, they are told that this is a group of people from the land of Canaan. And I thought, man, if they could have just waited three days, uh, they, would have, they would have saved a, uh, what becomes a situation that creates lasting consequences. And that's the third thought here tonight is, man, this one decision uh, just kind of rippled all throughout the rest of, uh, of the generations of Israel. You see, when it was discovered that these men were actually the enemies of Israel, what it did, first of all, it created division within the camp. And we didn't read all this, and you'll have to go and read the rest of, of chapter 9 to really see how the division unfolds. We'll mention it here in a minute. But when the people hear of it, uh, when they, uh, they realize, hey, wait a minute, we've allowed, we've allowed our enemies into the camp. Uh, we have made an allegiance with them. Uh, the people rose up, and they wanted to destroy these the Gibeonites. It's like, hey, listen, uh, these are the enemies of God. We need to go destroy them. But the princes won't allow it. The people begin to murmur, and this could have really turned ugly in a hurry. Now, this is where another part gets a little, uh, <clears throat> I guess, con not confusing, but man, it just makes me, uh, makes me wonder about how things go, especially in this culture. Because admittedly, as I've read that story numerous times, in my mind, I go back to this logical thinking. Um, I think it would have been easy to come to this conclusion where you say, hey, listen, why not just go back on the oath? Obviously, we made an oath. We made a commitment. We signed a contract, so to speak. Um, but we were not privy to all the information. Surely God will understand that, that we entered into this oath, but we didn't have all the information. And surely he'll be okay with that. Surely God will understand that. And from a human standpoint, I'm sure all of us would, would easily line up under that. Listen, we didn't have all the facts. I can see Joshua and his men sitting around going, listen, we made an error, absolutely, we made a bad choice, but hey, listen, we asked questions and they lied to us, so we should not be bound to this oath or this promise. Now, here's the reason, though. They not only gave the delegation of Gibeonites their word, apparently they made it such a strong covenant that they actually swore on God's name that they would protect them. In verse 20, this is how the princes answer the rest of Israel. They said, we will even let them live lest wrath be upon us because of the oath which we swear unto them. Again, much more scripture will, if you were to read the rest of the story, you'll see that they have basically made this promise in the name of God. They have brought him into the equation. So it would be one thing for them just to say, okay, we promise, we'll take care of you. Uh, that would be one thing. But they have basically invoked the wrath on, of God on anybody who breaks this covenant. So here's the problem. If they break this covenant, now they will be guilty of sinning against the Lord. And at least they understood that. They realized that. 
So what they've done now is they've literally let the enemy into the camp. Again, this could have really been a dangerous situation because now the Gibeonites have the freedom to come and go. They are at peace with Israel. Uh, the problem with that is it, would, it could, and it does at some point, actually expose the people of God to false gods and to false worship. And what we'll see, and I'll just reference a couple of places here in a minute, uh, it will be a thorn in the side of the Israelites for generations to come. You see, this oath made in God's name actually becomes kind of a noose around the neck of the future leaders of Israel. If you fast forward into 2 Samuel chapter 21, there was a famine that had been in the land for three years. And David began to inquire of the Lord why there was this famine. And apparently, apparently somewhere in the past, while Saul was still in reign, he had killed some Gibeonites. I don't know why, doesn't, there's no elaboration on this, but some, somewhere along the line he decided to rid himself of the, the Gibeonites. And here's what t transpires in 2 Samuel. It said, Then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord. The Lord answer, it is, answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites, and the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. And so here we are, uh, years later, after this, this oath was made with the Gibeonites, uh, here we are, two kings later, so to speak, and there is a famine in the land, there's a drought taking place, and it's because of this oath. God had promised, or he didn't, but the people had promised on God's behalf that those people would be protected. Well, Saul messed up and went against that oath, and now the entire nation is suffering for it. Now David, several kings later, finds himself having to make things right with the Gibeonites uh, to remove the famine. Verse 3 goes on to say in 2 Samuel 21, Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make atonement that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And you read the rest of that passage, and there were several uh, descendants of Saul that had to lose their life over this situation. And the point here is this. That oath had been made, and God took it seriously, and therefore it could not be broken. And so, what are they left to do? You go back to the events that are transpiring. In Joshua chapter 9, verse 21, it says, unto the, the princess said unto them, Let them live. But let them be hewers of wood and drawers of water unto all the congregation as the princes had promised them. And so they make them servants. They call them back together. Okay, you lied to us. Uh, we've spared your lives, but you're going to be servants. You're going to serve the people of Israel. Now here's where the grace of God can get to a place where honestly, at least for me, it goes beyond my understanding. This is a bizarre thing that begins to take place, and I can't fully explain it satisfactory to myself, let alone to you. But, but here's what happens. The Gibeonites integrate themselves completely through the generations into the nation of Israel. In fact, there in Joshua chapter 9, and this is actually turns out to be a strange privilege, their service, being hewers of wood and drawers of water, specifically was focused at the temple. Look at verse 23, it says, Now therefore ye are cursed, and there shall none of you be freed from being bondmen, and hewers of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. Now certainly that was supposed to be a, 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 a task, it was supposed to be a servant's position, and it was supposed to be because they are now bond people, but I want to tell you, it's still a privilege to be able to serve in the house of God. And that's what they do. In fact, years later, when you find different accounts of the Gibeonites throughout the history of Israel, the Gibeonites will still be serving in the house of God even when other Jews quit serving in the house of God. It's a remarkable thing that takes place all throughout their history. In fact, when it comes time that Israel is taken into captivity into Babylon, there's still a remnant of Gibeonites left that go into captivity with the Israelites. We see that in Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 6. It says here, talking about those that were taken into, who were taken into Babylon, it says there are the children, these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those that had been carried away whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away and came again to Jerusalem. And there's this list of different families and you drop down to verse 25 and right there it says the children of Gibeon, 90 and 5. So there are apparently at least 95 Gibeonites who make the the journey to Babylon to spend years in captivity with the Israelites. If you back up in Nehemiah chapter 3, what you find out, though, 
is when many came out of Babylon with Nehemiah to go back and rebuild the city, there are some Gibeonites that get to go back and they're there side by side with the people of Israel rebuilding the city. Verse 7 of chapter 3 says, and, and it's a list in this passage of those who are repairing different parts of the wall in the city, listing where they are. And it says in verse 7, And next unto them repaired Malaith, uh, the Gibeonite, and Jadon, the Maronite, the men of Gibeon, and Mizpah, unto the throne of the governor on this side of the river. Right there listed with all of the other Israelites are some Gibeonites rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. By the way, even when some other real Jews wouldn't make the trek back from Babylon. And the point I'm making is, here are the Gibeonites. They'd come to a place where they are amongst God's people hundreds of years later, and they are still serving Jesus Christ or the, the, the one God of, of all creation. And here's all I got to say about that. I can't quite make ends meet with this. I can't figure it all out. I can't completely understand it. I know this was a people who were condemned to die. I know this was a people who were under the wrath of God. And yet here they are, still a remnant, serving in the very temple of God. And all I can say to that is, what a testimony of the grace of God. Because even a people who had been condemned were still allowed to be, become actually amongst the people of God. And so here's some thoughts to consider. Again, there's a lot, uh, a lot here tonight. The first thought, though, I want to give us, uh, go back to, is the beginning of this passage um, and then the beginning of the thought and the title of the message tonight is, there are times that we become our own worst enemy. And that happens when we start walking by our own discernment. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 3 that we are to trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding in all our ways to acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Well, Joshua had done that on occasion, but on this particular occasion... There is no, there's no record of that. In fact, the opposite is true. It specifically says that they did not seek the Lord. What he did is he gathered his trusted advisors. That's not a bad thing. Problem is, collectively, they didn't seek the face of God. They counseled amongst themselves, and they came to their own conclusion. And that's a dangerous thing. They became their own worst enemy because of their own discernment. They began to lean on their own understanding. Alan Redpath, speaking on this idea, said this. Uh, he said, never trust your own judgment in anything. Uh, when common sense says that a course is right, you and I are to lift our heart to God for the path of faith and blessing may be a path completely opposite to that which you call common sense. I'll tell you, that's an important thought to consider. Now, Alan Pat Redpath goes on to make some very strong statements about that. Um, but here's why it's so important for us to, to never stop uh, seeking the face of God in any matter, no matter how small or how great it may be. We're never to lean unto our own understanding. And here's why, and we mentioned this this morning, you and I have to remember we are engaged in a war. Joshua was in the middle of a war. He is in enemy country. He's surrounded both physically and spiritually by the enemies of God. And at a time when he should have been on heightened alert, uh, he should have been all his senses up on, on DEFCON 5 or however you want to word that, instead of being ready and looking and diligent, he disregarded all the red flags. He ignored all the things that were there. He obviously had some questions and he threw them aside and ends up embracing the enemies of God. And obviously the connection here is you and I, as we talked about this morning, are soldiers. We are absolutely in a spiritual battle, and we are on the front line daily of a spiritual battle. You and I have to daily get up and put on the armor of God and be ready for all of the devices of Satan. And the truth is this, we often get pressured, don't we, to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes in the moment, it seems like common sense is, is something you can just say, well, this is obviously the right answer. And I'm not saying there's never a time for that, but I want to tell you, you ought to be careful uh, making the no-brainer decisions. We ought to be careful just leaning on our own understanding. Sometimes we pick the place that we're going to live or the place we're going to go to school or the, the people we're going to spend time with or the way we're going to spend our money. And, and we use our common sense because it seems to make sense that this is a smart endeavor. And I want to remind you, uh, if you haven't sought the Lord, you can't make those decisions. And I want to tell you, I'm not saying you aren't intelligent enough to make good decisions. I'm just saying Satan is active, and he'll use the very things that are important to you and I to actually get us to trip up. I want to remind you what James says. He said in James 1, 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. I'll tell you, sometimes it's hard not to just jump into some decisions. 
uh, whether it's to buy a vehicle or whether it's to take a job or to quit a job. And, and sometimes in our own understanding, we can come to the conclusion, this is the best thing I can do. I can't imagine this being a bad decision. I remember one time somebody told me that the deal of a lifetime comes along about every other week. And I've learned since then that is true. And sometimes we can be pressured because we think, if I don't make this decision right now, I'm going to squander this opportunity. I would tell you, be willing to risk squandering the opportunity rather than to get out of front or get out ahead of God. Always seek the Lord, or you may become your own worst enemy. Something else that stuck out to me is sometimes, now this, is, this, isn't a, this one's going to ruffle some feathers, but I'm going to do it anyway. Sometimes we have to live with the consequences of those hasty actions. Now, we saw how one act of indiscretion ends up leading to generations being affected. And one thing we can discern here, though, and this is, I think, speaks to at least they understood this. We've made a bad decision. Let's not make another bad decision and go back on this decision. Um, the Gibeonites um, were supposed to be the enemies of God. They were supposed to be destroyed. But Israel had made an oath with the Gibeonites. And they made it in the name of God, and therefore they kept the oath. That was the right thing. And I think sometimes, there, there are often many times in our life that we make some kind of oath with God, so to speak, and we promise to do something or we commit to do something, and it turns out it was the wrong thing to do. And I know in our human intellect and reasoning, it's easy to say, well, that was just a bad decision. I'm not bound to that. Well, I'll tell you, there are certain things that we do, especially when we make a covenant with the Lord, that we don't get to back out on. And I want to tell you one of those, touch on a very delicate topic here, is the very covenant of marriage. And I want to say there are times that even when you jump into marriage hastily, and I've seen it over and over again, sometimes you have to live with those consequences. I've seen way too many times people will get married to the wrong person or for the wrong reasons. And, and I've even been part of those decision makings where I've seen a, 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 a Christian lady marry an unsaved gentlemen and I will explain to them, listen you are being unequally yoked this is not a good thing or other pastors I've worked for make these statements and try to counsel people not to make those kind of decisions and they're like oh you know it'll be fine we love each other I think I'll be able to win him to the Lord and and they take the oath and then sure enough before long that oath of, of we'll be married till death do us part ends up becoming till you make me angry or until we're not in uh, not compatible anymore or until I fall in love with somebody else and and here's the problem. Our world around us embraces that mindset. In fact, if you seek counsel, if you're in an unhappy marriage and you seek the counsel of the world, the world will say, listen, you were young. You didn't know better. You made a bad decision. Um, you know, God isn't going to want to bind you. He doesn't want you to be miserable. He doesn't want you to be unhappy. Uh, you know, it's not that big a deal. God is, is more concerned with you having a joyful life. So he will understand. I've heard that reasoning and that logic. When I read passages like this where there are oaths and covenants made in the name of God, God doesn't think that's all right to walk back out on those covenants. In fact, uh, God gets very upset when we uh, break those covenants. God takes those oaths very seriously when they're made in his name. And so here's what I know, though. Now, this isn't, this isn't a license to jump into, into a bad situation you know better than to jump into. But I have seen this on the other, the other side of things. When we take seriously the covenants that we make, and I specifically will keep referring to the marriage covenant, it's amazing how often that God can make even a bad decision into something good. Now, again, don't take that. I've seen people make that statement. Hey, listen, I know this is the wrong decision, but I think God will bless me anyway. Now, if you go into a bad decision that way, I'm going to tell you, you have no right to expect God's blessing. But I have seen over and over again in these very situations, almost every church that I've been on staff at, there have been at least one or two marriages that have, have taken place this way, where a young lady or a young man marries somebody that they shouldn't, and they have several years of heartache and hardship, and then by the grace of God, something happens, and they begin to come to church together, and the person gets saved, and their, their family uh, turns into uh, kind of the model church family. I want to tell you, that's a blessing. I can't explain why God does that. It's just simply the grace of God. And here's what I would tell you is, listen, if you found yourself in a bad situation because of your own doing, don't make it worse by breaking the oath. Trust the Lord. Live the life in front of your spouse uh, under the biblical mandates that God has given us. Be the testimony for them. And trust God for his grace and mercy. I can't promise you that's what's going to happen, but I can tell you I see God over and over again extending grace 
even when we've created our own difficulties. That leaves me my last thought, and I don't know that I have a complete understanding and a complete way to word this, but all I can simply say is this, is God's grace is beyond amazing. We think about the Gibeonites under the wrath of God. There is no question, there is no question that they should have been uh, destroyed. There is no question that there should have been no treaty made with the Gibeonites. And so this is a tough one to get my brain around. The Gibeonites are deceitful. I can't blame them. They're just simply trying to preserve themselves. And Joshua and his leaders make a terrible decision. And yet God does something amazing in spite of all of that. He allows the Gibeonites to come into the very presence of God and to serve in the very temple where they worshiped him. So here's what I'd say. The only way I can even begin to understand uh, the grace of God towards the Gibeonites is this. I have to remember that in a lot of ways, we are Gibeonites. We were a people who were in rebellion against God. We were liars and deceivers. We were wicked at our very core. We were under the sentence of death before salvation. And yet God revealed himself to us, and he allowed us to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In fact, back in the um, book of Isaiah, Isaiah records some prophecy regarding, I believe it's to the Gentiles, being sought one day. And here's what Isaiah said. In Isaiah 65, verse 1, he said, I am sought of them that asked not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good, after their own thoughts, a people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrifice in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick. And you go on and read the rest of that passage, and, and there's some difficulties in there to completely understand, but we see clearly that God has said, though, that I will be sought or I will seek out those who haven't sought me, and I will show grace to those who don't have any interest in me. And certainly we have seen that at least take place. If no other place in history, we've seen it in the lives of you, you and myself through the grace of God and, and the salvation that he's given to us. In a lot of ways, we're just like Gibeon. In fact, the book of Romans says it this way in chapter 3, verse 11, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. I think that describes us. It describes who the Gibeonites were. Yet even in what seems to be a series of bad decisions, somehow God's grace still comes through. And here's, here's what I would say to you and I tonight. Regardless of where you find yourself this evening, regardless of what decisions that you've made, and, and how far you've turned from God, and how worthless you may feel, here's the truth. When we turn to him, his grace can be found. I can't explain it beyond that. I don't understand how a series of bad decisions end up in, in, in this, this kind of story where we still see God's grace, but it certainly speaks to how amazing his grace is. So I want to encourage you tonight. It doesn't matter how far you've fallen from him, his grace is still sufficient for you. Let me pray with you tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you this evening for just a few moments in your word and Lord, some uh, good warnings tonight from your word, as well as uh, some encouragement. Uh, Lord, I pray that, Father, certainly you and uh, your people, and, and myself included, we would, we would be people that would never uh, stop seeking your face for the decisions that we need to make uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Lord, we need your wisdom and understanding. God, we certainly know that if we uh, fail to do that, there will be consequences. And sometimes we'll have to live with some consequences that we didn't have to because of those bad decisions. I just pray that you would remind us to seek your face daily. And maybe for those that are struggling right now because of a series of bad decisions and, and maybe they feel like they're hopeless, right now I pray that you would extend grace and let them know that your, your grace is sufficient and it's far beyond our understanding. I just pray that their hearts would turn to you. Lord, we thank you for your love and your mercy. And we pray all this now in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you again for being with us tonight. We're uh, looking forward to next week where we get back to really pretty much a normal uh, uh, routine on our Sundays. Uh, kids ministries on Wednesday nights will start back up on the 10th and uh, the rest of our stuff will be going starting next week. So we look forward to seeing those of you who are uh, ready to come back. Uh, we look forward to seeing you. I, I hope that all of us will be able to feel comfortable soon to return to the house of God. But uh, know that we're praying for you. Let us know if there's a way we can be an encouragement to you. But until then, uh, we'll be praying for you and we'll see you soon. God bless you.